Greetings, everyone. Welcome back. Anthony Russell here from Banners on the Wall and here with one of our stories for our Hockey Stories series. Now, in Hockey Stories over the last, I think, five, six years we've been doing this, we've gone and talked about a lot of hockey history. We've talked about stuff in World War II. We've talked about stuff behind the Iron Curtain. And we've talked a lot about the present. And without kind of wanting to be a bit too hyperbolic about the man I'm speaking to, it's now time to talk to someone who's really making some hockey history of his own. I'm joined on the line by the first ever head coach of a hockey team at a historic black college. He's the head coach of the Tennessee State Titans. I'm joined by Dante Abercrombie. Dante, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me. No, oh, thank you so much for staying up so late to have this conversation. I really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, of course, the time difference, folks, means it is about sort of 20 past 10 as I'm uh, as we're talking here in the UK. A bit, bit of a nicer time on the uh, on the Eastern Seaboard because uh, full disclosure before we start, Dante, I'm a Caps fan, and I'm a very, very long-standing Caps fan from back in from back in the doldrum days of uh, of you know some people like uh, Jakob Kleppis and uh, and Sotheby on the roster and things like that. I was uh, I was there before over. So uh, you and I. the woods because you're originally sort of a, uh, from around the washington dc area i have been there on my honeymoon but uh yes i'm born and raised in washington dc so it's i've been a caps fan since i was on the ice for the first time so um ted leone's just everybody at the washington capitals has done more than enough for myself and my my brother my brother actually received an nhl scholarship to go to school so they paid i think it was ten thousand dollars per year for my brother to go to college so it was phenomenal. And, and the folk here in, in Great Britain may not be massively, well, obviously, understandably, not hugely aware of some of the minor hockey stuff that kind of goes on in that in the in the uh, the DMV area around Washington DC. But your part, you were as a child, I believe, you were part of, sort of that Fort Dupont hockey program, which has been responsible for just bringing through so many kids, not you know, of a variety of different sort of ethnic uh, ethnic and coloured makeups as well. I mean, just it's one of those sort of programs whenever you get involved in in washington capitals bits and pieces you hear about it because of so, of so much great work yeah, it's, it's the, historically it's the oldest um, black program or diversity program in the world the tennessee state university tigers your jerseys were revealed the other day they are a work of art they are beautiful, yeah, beautiful. they're they're pretty sweet they um everybody has reached out one wanting a jersey but two just saying they're phenomenal like this this needs to be on the ice very soon because they are like you say they're an absolute work of art they need to be in the museum they probably will end up in the museum at some point but they absolutely are beautiful i do need to ask the question because of course this isn't a thing that happens here in great britain but the the notion of a historic black college is not something that we have here um irrespective of you know britain's own relationship with you know with race and with color people have always ended up kind of being filtered through into sort of the mainstream kind of universities there's never really been colleges for for, uh, for people of color or, or or specific kind of ethnicity in that kind of sense to explain this to people here in american sporting terms particularly american university sporting terms what you guys are doing at tennessee state is a really big deal isn't it it's huge. HBCUs were founded. Um, obviously, people probably know the history of, of America and, and just the race relations here. So in the mid to late 1800s and in early 1900s, most individuals that look like me weren't able to study at higher education uh, institutions, whether that be college or university. But what they were allowed to do was be able to establish a some of them called normal schools, some of them called institutions a school for um, African Americans. So even though they were allowed to be educated, it wasn't necessarily at a, what are called PWIs, predominantly white institution. Most of the schools that were founded in that way are still, or I say a good amount, are still around today. Um, but it, you don't have to be black to go to the school. Just same thing with the hockey team. You don't have to be black to go and play at Tennessee State. But the historical significance is is absolutely there. The fact that an HBCU has seen hockey grow to a point where it says we want to have hockey on our campus is is phenomenal. 
It's also, I mean, from my, if I remember rightly from some of my reading, I was doing sort of preparing for this as well. Tennessee State, as far as I'm aware, is the only historic black college in the state of Tennessee, I want to say, I was reading as well. So it's it's a real kind of beacon point, not just, uh, you know, within the, within the state, as well as the fact that, you know, Nashville, Nashville's turning into a hockey city now. Like, we can't, we can't really sidestep it anymore. The Predators have made, have made massive strides in the, uh, in the community there, to the point where you think of, obviously a slightly problematic situation they've had in Arizona, but you know, the, the rise of the Sun Devils as a hockey program in it in the NCAA has been really, really big. I assume you guys are kind of looking looking toward looking out west a little bit and kind of thinking this is something we can do too. Absolutely. I mean everything happened in Arizona happened in Arizona, but you look like you say the Sun Devils, um, they were able to move that franchise up to to Utah. And I would not be surprised to see hockey go back to Arizona at the professional ranks at some point. Um, I can't speak to the number of HBCUs in uh, Tennessee, like the actual number, but I do know that, the, that there's roughly 100 in the United States of America. So there's still pockets of HBCUs out there that are still stuck in that history of um, just, just the HBCU lineage. Uh, but hockey in the South is growing. If you want to go look at some the work that the AAU has been doing and the ACHA have been doing at South Carolina and Georgia and Alabama. These schools are filling their arenas and their students are coming out to support. And it's really good hockey. And I think the NCAA is at a point now where they also want to track and, and move into these spaces. But it can't just be one team. We aren't as Southern as Alabama Huntsville was. A few mm. years ago, yeah. but being in Nashville, we are. I haven't looked across the line. Arizona State may still be the most southern, but we are the most southern, definitely on the eastern side of NCAA hockey. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see some more join, hopefully down the line. Yeah, I mean NCAA hockey is starting to kind of take a bit more kind of notice here in Great Britain. We've had things like the like the Bell Pot tournament that's been happening over in Belfast on and off for the last few years. And British hockey, both uh, our top level in the Elite League and our second level in the National Division, have really become a place for, for athletes from uh, from from NCAA schools, both Division One and Division Three, as well as schools up in Canada from U Sports as well. It's proven a, a rich place for young men particularly straight off to the back end of, of university to come and kind of play your personal hockey story is somewhat different than a lot of the young men that you're hopefully going to kind of bring through because i believe you are the first west auckland admirals former player to be uh, to be interviewed uh, on on banners on the wall and as somebody who watches a lot of australian and new, and new zealand hockey i've got to ask the question because you weren't there for a very long time but they 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 really take care of people who go over who go all that way down to New Zealand to go play. That experience was phenomenal, and and I know I've used that word quite a bit. So yeah, I've had a lot of phenomenal moments in the past mm -hmm. few years. But the way that and I was in Auckland, so I was in the major city. But the way we were treated, the way the fans came out and supported, we actually had. Uh, a fellow individual from Great Britain, Dean Conks, was on our team. So he's he grew up. Nottingham, former Nottingham Junior, former Sully Hall Baron. We know Dean very well. Oh, yeah. He's a phenomenal individual. And actually, I worked with another local um, coach, Alex Smith, um, at the Washington Little Caps. He's also from Great Britain. But either way, it was a great chance for me to just get over and experience a different way of life. And my wife and I definitely want to go back at some point. It was a phenomenal experience. And if anybody gets a chance to head down to New Zealand, do it. Yeah. hundred percent of, uh, there's a few, uh, it's one that one of the strange things about being involved in hockey media, people, you people start asking you the odd questions of how you can start getting to places, which is always a bit of a, a bit fun, but either way, your, your on ice career has not really mirrored some of the the phenomenal kind of places that you've been because your your elite prospects page is your playing career very short your coaching career is almost like like a page and a half of a4 because you have you've put the miles in my man you have really you have really really put you know put on your work boots and, and gotten yourself around to try and get yourself into this into the position that you're in including i mean you were part of that you were part of, sort of the nhl uh, series that was on their uh, on their YouTube channel. You and um, uh, you, you know, you and one of your colleagues, whose his name is escaping me at the moment, uh, Nathaniel Brooks. Nathaniel, 
apologies. Yeah. Uh, which was there. You spent some time as well working with the Toronto Maple Leafs as well. How do you reflect on this journey? Because you must pinch yourself on a daily basis at this point. It's unreal. And it's it started with just the love of the game. I came back home and wanted to coach. And this was 2008, 2009 season. And I caught the bug, meaning I wanted to play again. So I looked left, looked right. All of my former teammates were playing either D1 college or collegiate or professional. I was like, if I skated with them, I played on the same line. There's no reason that I can't. So even though the elite prospects doesn't show it, I did training camp after training camp after summer training. Got cut, got cut, got cut. East Coast, uh, SPHL, like all of the pro ranks in in America. And the lockout was one of the best things to ever happen to me. The lockout, I got a chance to skate with the Washington Capitals. Um, the entire lockout helped to build my confidence. That following year, um, or sorry, I had gone to New Zealand and came back and was supposed to be playing in the ECHL because I had a coach that said, all you have to do is play and you'll have a spot. So I came back, lockout happens, my spot is now definitely gone. Um, but building that confidence was phenomenal. I met Graeme Townsend around that same time. Uh, Graeme Townsend's first Jamaican born player to play in the NHL and coach in the NHL. And he spoke to me, he's like, Dante, you may or may not make it to the NHL as a player, because that's what I wanted to do. NHL bound was something I used to always say to, to myself to hold myself accountable. But he was like, you will get there as a coach. He's like, I've been there. I've been around some of the best. You're absolutely going to get there. And here we are roughly seven to eight years later. And I've guest coached for the San Jose Sharks. I just finished a guest coaching stint with the Predators, guest coached with the Coyotes, scouting program with the Bruins. I work and do a lot of stuff with the Washington Capitals. And I spent an entire year with the Toronto Maple Leafs as a uh, coaching development associate, which essentially I was an assistant coach for all three teams, working on many different things on the ice, in the locker room, during the game. Um, I did almost 120 professional games that year between all three teams. So it's each step has prepared me for this one. Each, that's why they always say you can't skip steps. You can't take the elevator until you've taken the stairs because you have to see what each level has to offer because you don't know what you're going to need when you get to the top level nothing like getting a level four and saying hey you needed something from level two and level three so that's why i'm glad i got a chance to stop youth hockey college and now uh and professional and then now back to college as a head coach yeah and i mean i mean you spent last season with um with stevenson university in in ncaa division three having been with toronto the year before i give a culture shift but I, but I imagine, but that, it's a, like you say, you, you sort of, you can't, you can't skip steps and you slowly kind of built your way now to kind, to kind of being a head coach. What was the, what was the big thing you took out about year into Toronto, in Toronto into going to Stevenson last year? Because it's a very, you know, there's some of the glitz and glamour that's probably there. And having been, having, you know, having been to Toronto and I've seen what it's like, I've seen what the, the Maple Leafs are like and, you know, the Marlies, of course, for, you know, probably the best one of the best positioned AHL teams in the entire league. NCAA Division Three is not quite the same. <laughs> is my right. thing. I would, I would say pour into that one. I would say I'd go both directions, and I want to speak to the first one. Actually, I'll speak to the last one first. Hmm. Hockey's hockey, and the only reason that I was able to feel that way was because of my transition from Stevenson to Toronto. Mm -hmm. So the last one is like hockey's hockey. We'll figure it out. It helps obviously to have seen what I've seen, helps to validate for sure what it is that I'm saying. But going from Stevenson to Toronto, where you're walking in and it's you're being asked from day one, minute one, to execute on some tasks that directly um, depend, like the game directly depends on what it is that you come up with. That's from moment one. And it's, you know what? You are prepared and you're capable. The same work that you put in at Stevenson is the same work you need to be doing here. It just, obviously the focus is probably a little bit different, but I've been preparing for this for a long, I've been communicating with collegiate and NHL coaches for a long time behind the scenes. Manny Malhotra already had a relationship before I got there. Spencer Carberry 
I already had a relationship with well before I got there. And I got to sit in between these two individuals that were friends of mine when I got there. So um, it was it a culture shock. Absolutely. But it was more so, hey, guys, I'm just one of the one of the guys, another coach here to help you be the best version of yourself that you can possibly be, whether it's with the Maple Leafs, Austin Matthews or whether it's Liam McCanny with Stevenson University. How many medals is your wife, has your wife earned at this stage, helping uh, backstopping you to this dream of yours? Oh, it's funny. We were just talking about it. I, she always says big gifts, big gifts. I was like, all right, I'll just get one of those big blow up balloons, you know, <laughs> just put a lot of air in it. But no, she honestly is the reason why I chase what it is that I chase. I, and most people don't know this story. Honestly, I haven't, I don't think told it on a podcast before. But when she was in, we were in college and we were dating. Um, she was accepted to Emory to study something that she really wanted to study. And at the last minute, they said, hey, you know, last in, first out, we accepted too many people. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to honor your acceptance to the school for a doctorate program. And she mm -hmm. was distraught, completely upset. Yeah. And then she said, well, let me just see if I can still apply to Columbia and possibly get in after their deadline. Applies, gets in, and is like, okay, well, I guess I'll go to Columbia. That was then. She loves her alma mater columbia i don't want it to be taken that way but for <laughs> someone to be not disappointed but almost ah, oh, okay i have to go to columbia i said wow she yeah. has phenomenal expectations of herself and her life that's somebody i need to be around yeah and we have pulled and pushed each other along our journeys um to this point and i, I honestly i thank god for her because she's an absolute blessing we don't call them our better halves for nothing, I think, is probably the, uh, and yes, my wife is exactly the same. Big gifts or food. Food or gifts is generally it. <laughs> oh, I do, the food, I do the food thing, too. Funny story. So just real quick. She was pregnant with our daughter. Um, mm -hmm. And she was just like, oh, I really have a taste for like this and then this and this. I don't know which one to decide. So I was like, okay, well, I'll figure it out. I went and bought her this and this and this. And I came home with multiple bags of care. I was like, here, have at it. And she started to cry. She was like, this is the best day ever. So yeah, that, I've been in that situation too. So take, we'll bring it forward a little bit in time. And I don't, I assume potentially it was probably Dr. Mickey Allen, who's the director of athletics at TSU or whoever it is. That phone call comes. Dante, you're the man. Talk me through the next couple of moments and the emotions in that moment when you would got to the point where you were not just the head coach, you're building this program. It, it was that moment. It was just me. So it was a moment to just sit back and kind of breathe and say, this is happening. History is happening. And you have to make sure that you take care of this moment because there's going to be plenty of bumps and, and all that along the way. But Dante, this is happening and you're prepared. So enjoy, like really sit in this for a while. But I think what's more memorable, when I got the call for the Leafs, my son was in the car when Sheldon called me. When I got this call, that night my son had, um, of the announcement, my son had soccer practice. So my entire family was in the car driving to soccer practice. And it was call after call from friends that I haven't talked to in a while and all these other different people. And my son, it even got to the point where it, and this isn't to be egotistical or anything. He said, Daddy, are you famous? And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> but I will tell you this. If you do what you're supposed to do, if you are a good person and you take care of people and you work hard and persevere, great things will happen to you in your life. And people may want to call you and talk to you about what it is that you're doing. He was like, okay, Daddy. And then we jumped out the car for soccer practice. <laughs> or sorry, football. Oh, I forgot who I was talking to. You, you are fine. You are fine. I won't mention the Copper America schools at all. All the refereeing. Um, and and uh, given, given that this is what, where are we? Two days before England semi-final of the European Championships. Uh, we'll see when we put this interview out, and I might just cut this bit entirely, um, <laughs> or just leave it in. Um, but either way, the task is underway. Uh, September 2025, I believe, is when the pro is when the program goes live. Now, the one thing I've not quite managed to glean from some of the stuff I've reading is the team going into club hockey to start with, or are you guys going straight into NCAA competition? 
straight into NCAA Division One competition. The school is a NCAA Division One school yes. with no girls sports. So to me, I felt that one, the opportunity is there. It needs to happen. Um, but I also felt really bad about potentially starting a club team at this school, knowing that in a year or two years after its inception, we would transition to NCAA Division One. And to me, now I have 15 to 23 players that aren't able to make that jump for that first year to NCAA Division One mm. on campus and no longer able to live their dream of playing at Tennessee State University. And I just wasn't able to, to have that sit with me. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're going NCAA Division One, and there's other factors. That wasn't the only factor, but that was a real personal one for me. But yes, we are going NCAA Division One September 20, uh, 2025, 2026 season. Cool. Uh, I mean, obviously there's a few of the, a few of the newer schools that have joined NCAA Division One in, in sort of in the last couple of years, and I think I think of uh, Stonehill College, Augustina. Uh, I mean, Robert Morris kind of uh, Robert Morris kind of went away and came back. That initial road is rocky uh, for the most part for teams, and I think of someone who's you know I think of like Long Island and like and St Thomas for example, who've had you know who've kind of made uh, St Thomas obviously have sort of made it to conference play, and it's been it's been a slog. Like this is not going to be a team that comes out of the gate. And may not win a ton of games the first time out it's strange because university sport here in great britain is not a thing like there are sports obviously and there are inter university sports and i mean what the varsity ice hockey game in sheffield is the big sort of university ice hockey event of the year it gets seven thousand people in the hockey venue here in here in great britain but university sport is not is not really on the same kind of level this is a you know this is a big deal for kind of the university this is a huge investment from a bunch of different partners of course you know the nhl has been involved here the predators have been involved here a bunch of different organizations how do you how do you prepare yourself for what is to come because this is a you know this is not just going to be magic you know it's a good news story right now but when your nice results may be hard to come by how do you how do you sort of steal yourself or how do you ma maintain an element of resiliency that it's not going to be it's not going to be easy and it may not be fun to start with either i would say the biggest thing for me is one to identify what the goals are mm -hmm. and the goal the ultimate goal is a championship caliber program and that's on the ice off the ice in the community so I, in my office, will have, and I don't have an office yet, and probably won't for probably a year or so. That's just the way it works when you start a new program. Mm -hmm. um, on my wall, NCAA championship, I need to see that trophy. I need my players in their space, their lounge, wherever we decide to put it, they need to see that trophy. Everything we do is building towards that. I'm not saying it's going to happen in year one. I'm not saying it's going to happen in year two but we are gonna take the steps necessary in year one and year two and year three to get us to that place sooner than if we didn't focus on that at all. And how do we get there? It's by having the right conversations, talking to the right people, pushing as hard as we possibly can now because mediocrity is not what we're shooting for. We're not shooting to be a middle 30 team in NCAA division one. That is not success to me. I left professional hockey i left um interviewing and wanting to get back into the nhl solely to do this job i would not be here if i didn't want to win so that's what my focus um is and it comes obviously recruiting fundraising is a big one massive one for us because that's you know you need a ton of funds to be able to play and travel and recruit and all those other different things but there's still a lot that can be done to help support those along the way the because uh, the one of the other big things of course is is that being an independent school so i assume you're not uh, most colleges generally start as independent and i believe that's going to be the case for you guys as well is there a kind of like an initial kind of like right here's what we're wanting out of the first five years kind of thing or is it much much looser than that at this at this kind of stage because you'd assume most schools are kind of want, would want to kind of start and kind of aim towards getting into a conference at, at some point 
you might be a little bit far south for the NCHC, but I mean that doesn't stop that doesn't stop Air Force being in, in being in Atlantic hockey despite being in Colorado Springs. But what's the initial plan here? The so moment? yes, what's the initial the, the initial thing? the initial plan is to play as many NCAA Division One games in our first year, 25-26. We're already working on that schedule, 26-27. We've started um sketching in a couple games also for 26-27. But there's so much in flux in NCAA Division One college hockey right now. Yeah. There's movement because of other conferences that are now coming into hockey or now adding hockey and certain teams have to move from place to place. Mm -hmm. um, there's a potential addition of, I guess, even more Southern teams or just more teams in general. So I wouldn't want to commit to a conference right now, not mm -hmm. knowing what that conference or all conferences are going to look like in two to three years um so independent i think is the right way to go at the moment as, as our time is uh, starting to sort of run out uh, I'll, just a couple of sort of quick questions to just kind of end at the moment then as we're both caps fans favorite cap of all time favorite cap of all time i'd have to oh that's tough okay i have to give because he's a friend joel ward um and mike greer are absolute legends in my book um dsp is another one that you see the kind of the trend there but yeah. growing up two people olaf kolzik's i mean olaf kolzik and peter bondra were my two olaf kolzik is my favorite capital of all time that is the correct answer i have his signed rookie card next door in my on my hockey shelf um being from being from dc and because it's a, it's a, it seems to be a slightly controversial question whenever i ask it of my ask it of my friends there Nationals or Orioles? Nationals or Orioles? Uh, Nats. Good. This is also the correct answer as well, because being from DC, you don't really have a choice. The other thing, I the other thing I'll ask, and this is a bit like I say, you are. I don't want to say an anathema because that's the kind of the wrong word, but you are, you are now at a point where you are a beacon and a focal point for people who look like you. Let's put it that. Let's put it that way, because that was the terminology you used. And we have some really good, really talented young men of color playing hockey over here in Great Britain. And these aren't names that you will know, but maybe you might want to jot them down for some recruiting for later. But I think of people for my for my British viewers, I think of people like Brandon Ayliff, I think of people like Ethan James, I think of Jacob White Say, and these sort of young men. From someone who has been able to kind of do this much in hockey, and these are younger men in their late teens, early twenties. If you could give them a message from the other side of the pond, what would it be? Well, first thing is reach out to me. Um, my email is everywhere. My personal email is everywhere. Reach out and I will get back to you, especially if they mention this podcast. But the biggest thing for me is you belong. Um, this sport is yours and you never know who's watching. Like make sure, just like they may look to me, there's someone, I think, even more importantly, looking up to them. They're still trying to find out whether or not they love hockey or not, whether hockey is for them or not. So I want those individuals to make sure that they take care of that mantle, make sure they take care of that spotlight because they are somebody's idol. They look to them with the big googly eyes. Like, I want to be them someday. I want to be that individual someday. So take care of that. And then the last question that I uh, that I'll ask, and it may be uh it may be it may be slightly mean. Which happens first, given that you have worked for both organizations? What comes first? The NCAA Frozen Four title wheels its way into Nashville, Tennessee, and back to whatever rink you guys will be playing out for the Tigers, or the Leafs winning the cup. Oh, Leafs winning the cup. That's 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 an easy one for me. But the Leafs, the Leafs, the Leafs. You want to know why? Because we're not playing in 24-25. So here we go. Leafs win in 24-25 and we win 25-26. Done. <laughs> this is a man used to being diplomatic and being friendly to every play. Dante Abercrombie. From all of us here in the from all of us here in Great Britain. We wish you guys uh, every success as you build this program as you head towards September 2025. I'm sure before too long. There'll be a there'll be a Tennessee State Tiger playing in British hockey before too long. All the best with it, sir. Thank you for taking the time to speak to me.
Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was an absolute pleasure. You're doing wonderful things for hockey all over the world.